I'm Joanna Bryson. This event is a celebration of women in science. I want to show you how I moved from science through ethics to governance and how I have been using science throughout that entire journey. And I am currently using science to help people govern. My original goal was to understand intelligence, and I chose to do that through building artificial intelligence models of natural intelligence. As it happened, part of my path on that journey took me through MIT. And there, believe it or not, I was supposed to make this pile of motors and wires into the intellectual equivalent of a two-year-old child. I say pile of motors and wires without prejudice. When I worked on this robot, and when this picture was taken, actually, it didn't work at all. Yet, I would have people walking up to me and saying to me, it would be unethical to unplug that robot. And I said, it's not plugged in. And they said, well, if you plug it in. And I, I was really confused. I said, but it doesn't work. And they said, well, you know, if it works. And I said, what, what are you actually saying? And they'd say, look, what we've learned, and they're proud to know this, what we've learned from feminism and the civil rights movement is that we need to be generous in our understanding of what it is to be a human. And I thought, if what you learn from feminism is that a bunch of motors and wires, and, and let me show you this, there were lots of other robots, this is MIT, they worked, right? They didn't say this about these robots. So if you have a bunch of motors and wires, and it looks sort of like a person, then it's as much like a man as a woman is like a man, feminism is not done yet, all right? So eventually, I should say that this robot did behave beautifully. Uh, well, for example, it could play the drums. But it never actually became a two-year-old. Anyway, I wrote a bunch of papers about this entire experience. My first artificial, uh, artificial intelligence ethics paper was called Just Another Artifact, to try to get the idea that it's not a person. And then, that paper came out in 1998, I was one of the very few people who had been writing uh, ethics, AI ethics papers since the 1990s. So because of that, uh, since about 2010, I've frequently been invited to the table when people realized that AI is something that's affecting society. And when I got those invitations, even though it wasn't what I normally did, I leaned in, even before I read the book. So now I'm going to show you an example of some of my most recent work instead of my really old work, right? Okay, so this is not my work. This is actually an example of misinformation that helped inspire my work. Um, and so there's, there's so many problems with this slide. Uh, one thing is that it assumes that everyone that's East Asian is working together. Actually, let me tell you what the slide is. It's trying to say something about who actually has uh, a hope of controlling artificial intelligence, and it's looking at the largest, only the largest companies, right? So there's a lot of slides like this. So not only is this slide confounding all of Asia as if it was the same kind of thing, like the EU, but also it's assuming that uh, have, being a large company is a good thing. However, since the 19th century, Governments have known that too much market power in one company is actually a bad thing and can disrupt both economies and also governments. So last year, a colleague and I actually asked, what happens if we look not at market capitalization as, the, uh, as what should be included on this slide, but what about looking at innovation? Okay, so let's start from innovation and then see what market capitalization shows us. Okay, so what you can see here is on the, on the y-axis, the vertical axis, you're seeing the number of patents that these companies had that were filed in the WIPO, the global database of, of patents, just for one subset of things that was pretty much a good chunk of artificial intelligence. So this isn't all the AI patents, but nevertheless, um, and it's a, notice that it's log. This is a log-log scale. I hope you're all used to that now, thanks to COVID. All right, so the bottom, the x-axis, is again just market capitalization. And we're looking at every single company that had at least two patents. We were lazy, we didn't go for one. Okay, so every company that had at least two patents. And 
what you can see from this is that there's some really well-established companies that are doing great work and have been for decades that aren't that large. And then you also see some very, very large companies in, in just a couple of areas. So Saudi Arabia, uh, you can't tell that from this. The yellow, the gray is the United States, the red is China, the blue is Europe, and the yellow is everybody else. So you have Saudi Arabia's Aramco, Hoffman LaRoche's Swiss. So you can see that both market capitalization and filing patents are strategic decisions. I'm not saying that just any, com any company can have giant market capitalization or file a patent, but not everyone who can do that chooses to. You can see that Facebook and Apple here, they didn't choose to file a lot of patents, even though they're very, very innovative, because they have other ways to defend their, their, their IP, all right? So, and now with this slide, you can see how uh, these numbers sum up. So over here, what we see is that the European, the EEA, the area uh, affected by the GDPR, and China, they aren't that different by those two different measures, right? And then you see that the rest of the world combined, right, is actually bigger than China and the EEA combined, all right? And then America is bigger than all of the rest in this particular sector. This may be one of the last ones where the U.S. is still dominating. All right. So now that we've talked a little bit about what's really going on with regulation, and that was a big question, is, is, uh, is there a Cold War? Do we have, does Europe have to back the United States or else China takes over? All right, so let's talk a little bit more about what is regulation. So not a lot of people know this, but I do actually also publish in um, theoretical biology, a little at least. And that includes some work um, on gene regulatory networks. So in nature, uh, Regulation is basically whatever it takes to perpetuate some version of an organism, right? You keep changing, you know, cells or whatever, but it's still you. So perpetuating you into the future. So for example, breathing is regulating oxygen levels. In nature, there's two different kinds of regulation. There's up regulation and down regulation, and we understand that routinely, right? So that's actually also true of artificial intelligence. So with artificial intelligence, the vast majority of the regulation that's happening is upregulation. Countries all over the world are pumping huge investments into the digital economy. They're very concerned to see that every uh, company and indeed other kinds of organizations can get all of the benefits that uh, take advantage of uh, all the, the different kinds of uh, efficiencies that you get from using artificial intelligence. But for the rest of my talk here, I'm going to talk a little bit about downregulation, which can be about you know, making sure that a product is actually safe. Okay? In fact, contrary to what some people say, artificial intelligence regulation can be pretty easy. We just have to be transparent about how we build the systems. Okay, so to motivate this, uh, this thing about transparency, first I'm going to talk about some research I published back in 2017 with some colleagues. So first, to understand this, you need to understand what implicit bias is. So the, uh, the, the women's names are easier for humans to pair with family words, and men's names are easier to pair with career words than doing it the other way around. Okay? And we can see this by how fast people can do a task about combining those words. All right? It turns out that using those same words, if we look up how they're represented in artificial intelligence that's been trained using machine learning on human language, we get the same kinds of results. We show that the mathematical distance between the words, that the females' names are closer to the family words, and the men's names are mathematically closer to the career words. Okay? So that was this finding, and it made headlines around the world. But we didn't only show that, right? People thought that what we'd showed was that AI was sexist and racist. But actually what we've showed is that artificial intelligence is an extension of our own culture, which you know, I knew because I built it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we've also shown, though, that implicit biases reflect our lived experience. Let me show you how we know that. It's because we took some of these, these evil, sexist, uh, stereotyped uh, word embeddings. So now here this is in the y-axis on the left here. So these dots are the names of jobs from the U.S. labor statistics. 
So one of those blue ones down there is sadly programmer. It's a great job. Be a programmer <laughs> if you don't want to be a scientist. Okay. And the, the, one of those red dots up there is nurse. Okay. So that's what uh, the, the sexist word embeddings expect. The bottom the, is the x-axis here is the actual percentage of workers in the occupations who are women. And you see that's really well correlated. Okay. So our implicit reactions are not our ideals. They're, they're our, our lived experience. We explicitly negotiate our ideals, right? We do that so we can pick better futures. That's what we do with our consciousness, not with our implicit learning. All right, so here's the problem again. This is actually Finnish, and you see that the word uh, hain is actually either he or she in Finnish. Uh, in our paper, we did this with Turkish, but I just love this, this graphic from uh, Vyoko. So, uh, you can see that Hain gets translated into he or she depending on what words it's next to. So how can we regulate this? So let's say you're trying to make a translator. If What I've just shown you is that if we do things right, if we use just ordinary machine learning, nothing broken about it, we're going to get these stereotyped, out, we're, we're going to get these stereotyped outputs that reflect our lived experience. Okay. Now, let's say that you can figure out what those should have been. Now, this is not easy, but if you can figure out what fair means, then you can go ahead and do something to translate from one of these, from the stereotyped outputs, to the predefined fair outputs. And you could either do that with some kind of explainable AI where someone's hacked something, right? Or you can uh, use machine learning now. Again, just use a simple transparent algorithm that we understand that's well understood. And you've got these tests to see if you're finished. But the point is, the whole thing is the translator. So you don't panic about one part of it replicating stereotypes. All right. Yeah, every stage should be audible, and every stage should be replicable. So accountability for AI is possible, but it requires reliable enforcement governance. So can we trust governments? No. <laughs> governments are exactly like AI. In fact, some people think that they are a form of AI because we build them. Therefore, we have to actively make sure that governments at work and governments are transparent. But governments are a principal means through which we organize to ensure that everyone does what's fair and just and sustainable. And sustainability is the only thing that can allow us to keep flourishing. So regulation, not just innovation, is actually our goal. We want to use science and power to keep humanity breathing. Thank you.